<laughs> yeah, excellent. That will that will work. Funny script for a video. <laughs> Just a few jokes in there. Mm, that's a good one. <laughs>《Hello Internet friends, in this video I'm going to talk about my five favourite games of all time. Now how can I have a YouTube channel and not have done a video like this already? I don't know, I'm an idiot, but the idea was suggested to me by a friend called Oryx, goes by Virtual Rambling on Twitter. He has his own YouTube channel, also check it out for some chilled picturesque walkthroughs of games. Yeah, he gave me the idea and I thought, well, I've answered his question on Twitter, maybe I can answer it in the form of a video. It's always interesting to talk about those games that have influenced you and you've enjoyed the most. I'm going to go from one to five. I don't think these are necessarily in order of preference. They're just my top five, which is why I'm not holding like number one till last. They're just my top five. Anyway, let's get on and talk about some games. First on the list for me is Skyrim. This is a game I've returned to again and again over the years. It's always there, always a possibility when I'm looking for something to play. I didn't actually play this when it first came out. I had to wait until I had a decent enough PC to run it and I actually missed out on Morrowind and Oblivion, the precursors to this game. There's some debate out there about how the mechanics in Skyrim were dumbed down from those previous games. Those games were more traditional RPGs, some traditional RPG mechanics like um, skills, the skill system, the spell system, the class system. You're locked into a, a class from the very beginning. Skyrim functions slightly differently in that you go out into the world and by virtue of what you do well, as you're exploring, you gain skills. I actually like that a lot more than those previous games. I've never liked games where I'm locked into a particular class from the very beginning because... I don't know if I'm going to like that class. I like to explore and I like the character to build and grow uh, as I go. So for me, mechanics are the thing that comes first, no matter the kind of depth of the world and the richness of the characters. For me, games are about mechanics and whether I enjoy the way they play, first and foremost. Yeah, so that actually really drew me in. It allowed me to explore the world. The world itself, I don't think the world of The Elder Scrolls is a particularly original fantasy setting. But in this particular case, I didn't really want that. As I said, I came to uh, Skyrim later once I had a PC to run it, but I actually checked out Oblivion and Morrowind after the fact. And the Morrowind game is the one that a lot of Elder Scrolls devotees look at and say that's the truly imaginative creative thing and they became ge more generic later with things like oblivions towns uh very very reminiscent of medieval europe and then we go viking with skyrim they like the originality of morrowind it didn't bother me that i that the world was not necessarily a leap of imagination i liked the this snowy scandinavian wilderness that i was exploring and it was beautiful, atmospheric, everything working in tandem, really, sound, graphics, all those things you expect. Combat is a little bit lackluster in Skyrim. I'm not uncritical of games that I really love, and I can see where they could be improved. Skyrim's combat was fairly middling. The spell system for swapping between your different hands to cast spells it doesn't it's not great from the vanilla game, but that brings me on to the second part of why I love Skyrim so much and that's the modding scene. Really the gamers have improved this game exponentially since they started tinkering around with it via the creation kit and they've added so much stuff and that's one of the reasons I return to this game again and again. When you find one of those really in-depth interesting mods that adds new game mechanics again you see it's game mechanics for me that uh, make things interesting again for instance when i discovered the mods that allowed you to turn any npc in the world into a companion that turned the game from a single player adventure for me to a party of adventures like a game of DD &D where you would form your party and come up with your own narrative between the characters and they had unique lives of their own and I was building the narrative as I go. I like tools and mechanics that allow me to do that and create my own story. That kind of thing. Other great mods with Skyrim like Frostfall, which turns it into basically a survival game. Uh, as you try to survive in the cold, you have to find food and you can tinker with all the settings to make it harder, easier. So you kind of come back to Skyrim 
And with the selection of mods that you use, you can change the nature of the playthrough. Uh, it's huge. It's massive. And it's the modding that makes it continue to be relevant today, even up against more modern uh, single player open worlds, RPG games like Cyberpunk I've played recently, The Witcher 3. It still has probably actually through the mods, more mechanics, more stuff to dig into than those games because it's being added to all this time. And if someone were to come to me and say, what's the best uh, single player RPG with open world, I would probably say modded Skyrim still. Uh, and that's one of the strengths of the game. Bethesda, uh, I think he's aware of it and they've tried to capitalize on it with their mod kind of shop front on their website but it's really the best thing with modding is to just leave it in the hands of the players through the nexus and stuff like that and allow people to just do their own thing when companies try to fence in the mods and deliver them it never really works maybe it's better for consoles uh, as i said i played this on pc but modded skyrim yeah absolutely one of my favorite games always there I'm always thinking, what can I add to it and maybe do another playthrough? All right, so that's number one on my list. Not necessarily my favorite game of all time, just in the top five. So let's go on to my second one, which is Star Wars Galaxies. No surprise to anyone who follows the channel. This game excited my imagination from the very beginning, and it was in a time when MMOs were really the hot thing playing online with other players this added the opportunity to do that in a star wars universe and it was really at that time when simulation and experimentation with worlds was really a thing in mmo game design but this game still has all those elements that i like the most the exploration the economy the ability to coordinate with other players, build cities and create a society within a game. And it was Star Wars. And that's a big draw for me. I've loved Star Wars ever since I first saw it. At what, what, what age would I have been? Age six. Very much set in that original trilogy timeline. They added elements from the newer movies later, which are fine and add, I think, a lot of texture to the world and just keep it relevant and interesting. I was so excited by the idea of MMOs at the time. I got involved with a community. We organized and created a kind of a clan, a, a corporation, in fact, it was, that we were going to go in and exploit the galactic civil war for monetary gain. That was the narrative that we came up with for ourselves. And by virtue of the complexity of the game and the simulation aspects, you were able to do that again. I think this is going to become a theme as we go through my various choices, but I like games that give me mechanics, complex systems through and uh, in-depth character options so that I can come up with my own narrative. That's what I like doing the most. I was totally able to do that with Star Wars Galaxies. It was very, very addictive and I played it to death in my mid-twenties. I was playing this game and I played it at the end of a long shift at work and I would come home and just immerse myself in this game, play it for hours and hours at the <laughs> days sometimes. I'm, uh, should I admit that on the internet? I've already done it. It allowed you to live the fantasy of being a Star Wars character. And the thing that I like the most is that you didn't have to be the hero. You could be one of those background characters. You could create, you know, the guy at the back of Jabba's palace who you see only for a frame, a few seconds in the movie. You think, what's his story? You could be that guy. You didn't have to be Luke Skywalker. And even though there's this strange, maybe it's not strange. It's just the, the way people create fiction. But the idea that everyone wants to be the hero, I don't believe that's true. And I believe people actually identify with people who are not the hero sometimes and who stray into situations. And that's a compelling story. The person who shouldn't really be there, but is there and has to deal with whatever the hell is going on. and Or the person who doesn't want to be a hero at all and they aspire to be a successful business person or a an entertainer or something. The range of things that you could do in this game were huge at the time. I still play it to this day and the game has had something of a resurgence over the last few years as the emulation scene has become more locked in. There are various teams working on versions of Star Wars Galaxies and doing an amazing job keeping it relevant. It's still always going to look a little bit retro. But the depth of the game, the stuff you can do is amazing and 
not many games that release now allow you to do the number of things and that's why people are still playing this MMO today. The emulation has the same problem that the original game had demonstrated by the fact that it was closed and you were unable to play it. SOE decided to close it because they lost the Star Wars license. The game wasn't doing as well as I think Lucas Arts at the time would have liked it to. And that's why I always have a question mark over any MMO that I choose for a list like this, because the game is never really yours. You never really have it for the rest of your life. It can go away at any time. It's the nature of MMOs and that's why I would always caution against anyone becoming too invested in these online games. It's something that is happening more and more with AAA development today. They're trying to get everyone to be always online all the time. Uh, games release with multiplayer elements that rely on servers that the company provides. Those servers can go away at any time and it's something that as gamers we always need to be aware of. If you want ownership over the things that you love the most, MMOs, online games, they're always going to be problematic in that respect. And that's why I always have tried to maintain a balance between stuff that I play online and stuff that is like Skyrim. It's always going to be on my PC. Maybe in the future, I'm going to, there, there'll be some enterprising people who keep it relevant for newer systems, but they're always going to be there. They're doing that. They, you own the game with these MMOs, they could go away. So that's perhaps why I didn't put it at number one. But like I said, I, I don't think these are necessarily one to five in order of preference, but the, there's always that note of caution. Anyway, I think I've said what I need to say about Star Wars Galaxies, great game. And if you feel like playing it, the server I would recommend is Star Wars Galaxies Legends. I've been playing on that for two years, thoroughly enjoyed it. Tons of videos about that, just like there is about Skyrim on my channel. I'll put links as I talk about these games because I think I've played most of them on the channel. All right, on to number three. Next is XCOM, the Firaxis remake. I played the original game, but I don't think I played it that much, really. I certainly can never remember beating it. I've, my feeling is that I wanted to like it more than I actually did. So when Firaxis announced that they were bringing out a new version of the game, turn-based, all those cool things that you like, strategy from the original game, I was really hyped for that. Interestingly, they announced another game that was a tactical shooter, third-person tactical shooter. I think it was XCOM declassified the bureau or something in the before they announced this remake so i was one of those people that was really angry that they were trying to because they've tried to do different versions of xcom that strayed away from the turn-based model and they never work that's not xcom so i was really angry and then they announced this in the wake of that game so i don't know i mean i don't subscribe to the idea that these companies are really doing this kind of counter marketing where you announce something bad so you get good preds when you announce something good but it just seemed well fortuitous maybe they were in development they got the license for to try a few different XCOM games and they were doing two at the time anyway that's a bit of background to the announcement of the Firaxis remake and how i was looking forward to it and then when it came out i just felt like they nailed the atmosphere of xcom really really well whilst also streamlining the gameplay in a very calculated and i think ultimately successful way they took away the idea of time units action units for your guys so it sped things up a lot they took away some of the bullshit from that original game Yes, sure, you have a, a group of squad of 12 people, but they're pretty much expendable. They die so often. They focused in on a fewer number of characters. You still get connected with them, but each individual squad member stands out a little bit more from the crowd. And for me, that is where the fun of XCOM truly lies, coming up with the backstory for each of your characters, getting connected with them, feeling emotionally attached to them. And then when they die you're cut up and it's a it's a big blow and you're coming up with that narrative again creating it for your own squad and your own bunch of characters uh as i've said that's what i'm looking for from a lot of games additionally the whole thing with the iron man mode i think i'm sure there were iron man modes before they might not have been called iron man modes but the idea that you're going to go through and you don't continue you don't have any lives or anything and what happens happens you have to live with it i feel like the first time i really became aware of that was with this game they really pushed that aspect and 
it harks back to the difficulty of the original. You have to go through and you have to live with your mistakes and um, the deaths of your characters. They made sure that was there in this version by giving you the Iron Man mode. I think they got the atmosphere just right. That weird sort of mix of gameplay that XCOM introduced where you have the world map, strategic overview, and then you go down and do specific missions that add towards the end goal of fighting off the alien invasion. It's just a compelling idea, it always was, and they stuck very closely to that. I think it would have been a mistake to change that. And they understood that that was the core of the gameplay. But then they made those important improvements like streamlining the movement. You have a move and a shoot or two moves. It's clear what is half cover, what is full cover and so on. You can get a sense of the tactical situation on the battlefield really quickly. And they also got away with some annoyances from the original game like hunting for that final alien on the map that you could be doing that forever in the original game this they walk around in pods and pretty much as you go across the map you will come across all the aliens that annoying alien hunt at the end of missions they just improved it in so many ways to this day this game is the one on steam that i have the most hours 755 hours i have played of this original xcom followed close behind by the follow-up xcom to war of the chosen and then after that, it's Skyrim for me on the on my Steam list. Anyway, a fantastic game. If you haven't played the original, well, the XCOM XCOM 2 for Axis's follow-up to this one is, is a superior game in many ways. But it changes the setting. It's not the classic setting and the first invasion. If you really want to get a sense of where XCOM comes from uh, in the modern era, go with this game first and then play its sequel. Uh, the sequel takes place years after the invasion has succeeded in this case, and it's more of a kind of a futuristic landscape. This one sticks closely to the idea of just modern day Earth invaded by UFOs, and, and that is just a, such a classic uh, X Files the B movie concept invasion of the body snatches. There's all sorts of things going on in XCOM, but they, but Firaxis nailed it. Fantastic music as well, uh, harking back to the original, but um, obviously modernizing it and making it sound really good for the modern day. Recommend, recommend. I know this is not a recommendation, it's just my favorites, but if you haven't played it, do play it. It's really, really good. My next game is Final Fantasy Tactics, another turn-based strategy game where you're creating a team of characters who you get to know, you get connected with, very much like XCOM. I didn't realize until I chose these two things how closely they were connected. This is it came out in the 90s by Square. It's in the Final Fantasy universe, as you might expect, but each Final Fantasy game has its own particular story and world and tactics corresponds to that is quite an in-depth story in fact about two warring kingdoms you're the son of an important noble the half son and you're kind of trying to prove yourself in the world that's the character you can kind of name your character and that is you but what you're really doing is creating that party and it's the depth of those mechanics in this particular game that i really really like to this day there's very few games that allow you this much customization and character creation each of your characters can basically be any job in the game there are all these different jobs like knight squire archer Dark Knight, Holy Knight, all these different things and you can kind of mix and match them, create unique characters by having two skill sets from different classes that you can combine and searching for those different jobs is a big part of the game. In a lot of games you're searching for items, right? In this game you're searching for the ways to unlock those powerful characters like Samurai, Ninja. You have to be a Master Archer, picking them out of thin air at this point because I can't quite remember, but you have to be an Archer and maybe a Thief in order to unlock the Ninja character and you want to get those unique rare classes it's tactically in depth starts very very simple but once you start to unlock all those characters you see the options that are available there are some challenging battles particularly in the later parts of the game it has a very cute cartoony pixel art style that i've always liked one day attempts to kind of reproduce final fantasy tactics i've enjoyed but this the style of the game the graphics are just appealing to me and I played it for hours on end. Another game that I played at a time when I should have been doing other things. I was at university and played too much of this game when I should have been doing the essays and um, thinking about my future career. I was playing Final Fantasy Tactics. That's definitely a theme in my life. Don't know about you. <laughs> uh, 
And a little story of how I got hold of it. I had to have someone hack the... What did, what did they used to call it when you get your PlayStation to play foreign games in, uh, in your country of origin? So I had to take it to a shop where they cracked it open and put the chip inside or whatever so I could actually play this game and that made it feel even more special because most people couldn't get access to it and I was able to play it on my PlayStation at the time. It's a genre that's really fallen out of favour and but the, as I say there have been indie efforts to kind of create something along in the vein. Mo most recently Fell Seal. If you're looking for a modern day version of tactics and you don't want to mess around with emulators and things like that. Fell Seal is, re is really, really good, but it's not a genre that is hugely popular these days. I don't know why, because I still find it hugely compelling and I think there's an audience for it. Just stuff falls out of favor and then comes back later. So maybe there'll be a big budget one of these at some point. I still hold out hope for that. It has that strange quirky nature that Japanese games sometimes have when they deal with Western uh, settings. So it, it, although it's created by Square, a Japanese company, Japanese developers, but it doesn't seem to me set in feudal Japan. It's more of a Western medieval slant to the world. It's hard to articulate, but it has this kind of cuteness to it that comes from someone who is not a part of that culture, trying to almost replicate that culture. It's also created in a time when there were fewer tools available for developers to really craft the characters and get the acting and stuff. The resolution of the graphics doesn't allow the kind of character moments that modern games do. But even with those limitations, they were able to do it. And as I say, the story is, is complex. It's a political intrigue between these warring kingdoms. Actually, now that I think about it, it's good in that it gets rid of that oh so common idea of there's a big bad there's a big evil that is descending from the heavens in uh, fireball to destroy the world or coming up from below in which case whichever direction it comes the you know it's the big bad there's nothing like that in tactics it's about these warring kingdoms and trying to fight for what's right against injustice i i, I enjoyed that narrative so yeah like me if you enjoy messing around with game mechanics creating all those different classes and mix and matching and trying to come up with the optimum build and unique builds that aren't laid out by the game but you come up with through your own imagination this is the kind of game for that and it's really rewarding when you get one of those unique classes like the onion knight it's so weird it's it's this a late stage class that is really quirky and strange but I spent so much time trying to unlock it. Got there in the end. Final Fantasy Tactics. Make another one square. Come on. So here we are at number five. In my original tweet, I actually said that I couldn't pick another game because there have been so many that I've enjoyed over the years. It all merges together into a, an explosion of fun. <laughs> but for a list like this, I do need to pick something. So I was thinking, I don't talk very often about the games that I played very early on in my or gaming career if you want to call it that which one though because those old games some of them i return to for curiosity's sake but there are not many that actually hold up that i would still play today i like to watch retro channels like zypho who plays amstrad cpc games microcomputer games kim justice who also covers those kinds of games but if i'm 100 honest there's not many of those that i sit down and play today Final Fantasy Tactics is one of them, but that's 1997. Going back to one of those early games that I, I have returned to and that I would still play today, it's Rings of Power. I suppose you'd classify this as a CRPG, and in my research for it, I found out that they were planning to release it on microcomputers at one time, but it eventually got released for the Mega Drive. That origin goes some way to explain its uniqueness because there weren't many games like this on the Mega Drive, a kind of traditional RPG party mechanics. There was a lot of stuff like this on PC and maybe on the Amiga and the Atari ST at the time, but less so on the consoles. It's probably the first game of this sort that I ever played and it made a big impact on me. It had a huge map, a huge world to explore. Nothing like this that I'd played. The map actually rolls around so you can travel the globe basically. You start out going east and you will eventually wrap around and, and come back to where you started. And for the Mega Drive at the time that just seemed mind-blowing. It, it was such a scale of, of stuff and to be able to see a location on the map and try and figure out how you were going to get there across mountains, rivers and forests. 
It suited me because the very first part of the game, the story is pretty generic. There are rings of power that were shattered at the beginning of time and you have to go and find them. Very Lord of the Rings inspired, as you can tell from the name. But actually the first like quarter of the game is just you setting out as a single guy whose master has been killed and you'll set the task to find these important rings of power. But before you can do that you have to gather your party, you have to go to these individual towns, talk to the people there, find someone who can join you from these six colleges of magic. And by the time you've done that you've actually got a party that you've not rolled their stats at the beginning of the game. This is almost a step better in terms of storytelling in that there's been a quest associated with getting all of them into your party. I know a lot of games do that now and Baldur's Gate can point to that kind of thing and Neverwinter Nights, but this was certainly my first experience of it. The graphics are very basic now, but they still function. It has weird little quirks how much of this is to do with just coming up with something that would work on the mega drive that would fit on the mega drive for instance the the combat system is really strange each time you encounter a enemy on the map the game warps to this strange astral plane where you're fighting with magic against it doesn't even have to be a magical character it can be a bunch of guards but everyone fights with spells for some reasons. No one, no one swings a sword. Even the, even the bog standard guards in the in the castle and stuff. But at the time, I was unaware of how much of that might be to do with limitations of what you could do. I was like, I really like this idea that everyone in this world is magical and that's how they fight. It kind of worked. Still have it on my PC today, always available to play through emulation. So yeah, that's my number five. I could have picked a lot of other games from the early days of playing them, but that's that's the one that really jumps out at me. I think I've learned a lot doing this. I tend to think that I'll play anything, but when I think about my top games, it seems to be that RPGs and strategy are definitely up there. Even the RPGs that I've put on there do have a, a healthy dose of strategy involved and um, some in-depth mechanics and with Skyrim I was even looking to modify the game to be more like a party-based uh, role-play game so maybe maybe that's why it stuck with me so much. That's the point of doing this stuff I mean it's nice to share with people your favorite games but also you learn about your own preferences and it makes you think about the kind of things you're looking for next time i'll be looking on steam i think well you know a little bit more about what you're going to be really into now so look for those kinds of games more often when i'm stuck for games thanks for listening let me know your favorite games your five favorite games in the comments Hopefully do more videos like this. I've been thinking about what kinds of videos I can do concerning games. And um, when a topic like this comes up, I'm going to just jump on it and do a video about it. So I hope you will stick around for that. Do like and uh, maybe subscribe to the channel if you so wish. And I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.